This is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on AM560, The Answer. Good morning, Dan and Amy. Yesterday, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, in responding to the president's address and a renewed call for border security funding, had this to say about the crisis the president alleges at the border. But the president is rejecting these bipartisan bills which would reopen government over his obsession with for- forcing American taxpayers to waste billions of dollars on an expensive and ineffective wall, a wall he always promised Mexico would pay for. The fact is, President Trump has chosen to hold hostage critical services for the health, safety, and well-being of the American people and withhold the paychecks of 800,000 innocent workers across the nation, many of them veterans. He promised to keep government shut down for months or years, no matter whom it hurts. That's just plain wrong. The fact is, we all agree we need to secure our borders while honoring our values. We can build the infrastructure and roads at our ports of entry. We can install new technology to scan cars and trucks for drugs coming into our nation. We can hire the personnel we need to facilitate trade and immigration at the border. We can fund more innovation to detect unauthorized crossings. The fact is, the women and children at the border are not a security threat. They are a humanitarian challenge, a challenge that President Trump's own cruel and counterproductive policies have only deepened. And the fact is, President Trump must stop holding the American people hostage, must stop manufacturing a crisis, and must reopen the government. I would love. Has she ever been through a border crossing? You're going to scan a car to see if there's drugs? What is she, nuts? Well, I, 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 the, the thing that's curious to me about, I mean, there's a lot curious to me about that statement. Should we rip down the, uh, the barriers? Like the at, 350 miles that we already have in place? Yeah, places like Yuma, are they working Or you there? see your dead waters, just take it down, you'll see what happens. Also, um, the president says there's a humanitarian crisis. She calls it a humanitarian challenge. She says he's manufacturing crisis. Uh, Speaker Pelosi, could you uh, compare and contrast, distinguish for us what the difference is between a humanitarian challenge and a crisis? She seems to be conceding the president's point that there is indeed a humanitarian crisis, that uh, CBP is indeed overwhelmed at the border, that they do need more resources to properly care for people, and that uh, it would help uh, to close the loophole that prevents uh, border security from returning people to their country of origin as opposed to sort of housing them at, at Lindsey Graham put it, 750 bucks a day on the taxpayer's dime. So, again, who's holding the American taxpayer hostage? For more on this topic, in a first-person perspective, we're pleased to be joined by David and Sarah. He is a policy analyst uh, on the topics of homeland security and cyber policy with the Heritage Foundation, and he also spent some time yeah. uh, at the border. David, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. So, uh, I mean, just give us your first-person perspective on this uh, debate, I guess, the posturing, at least, that's going on, as to whether or not we have a real crisis that uh, extends beyond the caravan, just in terms of the day-to-day operation of border security on on our southern border. Yeah, what we're seeing right now is, uh, you know, uh, I think a uniquely new sort of phenomenon that was going on at the border. Not the, the caravan is certainly part of it, but it's also the, the 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 dramatic increase in women and children at the border. So overall numbers are down certainly, but we we have these unique challenges of these caravans and women and children coming across the border, which, as you mentioned, the loopholes that we have in our laws means that it's really hard for us to remove these people back to their countries in a quick and orderly way, which means we we either have to detain them, which is costly, and it leads to all sorts of other questions about, you know, can you detain children and all, all those sorts of questions. Um, and, but then it also means that sometimes we have to release them. And catch and release just means that we probably never see these people again. Uh, so, yeah, what's going on at the border is, you know, Clearly, um, you know, our, our resources are clearly overburdened and stretched too thin to be able to handle what's going on right now. And that's why immigration court cases, the immigration courts are so backed up and it takes like two years to have a, uh, your immigration court case heard. Something needs to change. And President Trump said that, that women and children are the biggest victims and that one in three women are sexually assaulted along the way while trying to get into this country. 
Um, from your first hand, from being down there, did you speak to any of these women and ask them, you know, why they're risking their lives and their children's lives to get to America? Yeah, we, um, a colleague and I went, um, uh, we actually also went to, we went to Mexico City and we, we talked to the caravan sort of, you know, en route. Um, and the reality is most of them are talking about jobs. Most of them are talking about they want a better life, which no one can blame them for wanting that. Right. Um, but, but the problem is, is that there's, that doesn't mean that you have an asylum claim, for example. Asylum is for people who have been persecuted because of their race, their religion, their nationality, their political beliefs. Um, and so I mean, most of these folks want you know, a better life. And I think part, you know, part of the solution then has to be what are we doing to work with countries in Central America so that those places are livable, so there isn't rampant crime and corruption and there is opportunity um, because ultimately that's the only you know viable solution in the long run we need to do a lot on our side of the border border security enforcing our laws but an important part of what can we do to make it so that these people aren't fleeing their countries and just always coming to the United States uh, that's that's another critical piece of the puzzle what about uh, sort of the organization that is pushing individuals to the border that's helping to sort of uh, squire the caravan for example we saw some documentary footage by other people embedded with the caravan over the last couple of months mm-hmm. uh, with Sin Fronteras as one of the groups, these these sort of uh, uh, advocacy groups that are organizing and pushing this confrontation and how how influential are they? How much of a part of the problem are they? Yeah, we, we, we saw that while we were down there. We, we attended one of the, the assemblies they were having. And, you know, when we went there during the day, there's just to the just to the camps, we saw, you know, we saw the people who have these, you know, sad stories and, and you felt for these people. And, and But then you went back at night and all of a sudden you saw you know, these, these, these activists come out, um, you know, people saying, you know, people who are actively there basically to tell people how to get asylum in the United States, even if they really didn't have a claim. But, you know, what's, what's the right thing to say? People, you know, speaking to the whole assembly about how you should they shouldn't trust the Mexican government. They shouldn't take the Mexican government's offer of asylum. You should go to America and demand your rights. Um, it's these types of people who they don't really actually care about the migrants. They're, they're using them as political weapons to just throw them at the border to try to accomplish some sort of leftist agenda, either regarding immigration in the United States or sometimes these are agendas that actually are more about you know domestic politics in Mexico or or Honduras or El Salvador than anything to do with the U.S. But this is what uh, this is what we saw, and it was very disheartening uh, to see. Yeah, how were the locals in response to the caravan? Were they supportive of them? Were they, you know, what was their reaction? Yeah, so so I mean, we were when we were in Mexico City, uh, it was largely sort of you know somewhat separated from the locals. They were actually all housed at a you know I think it was the uh, the Olympic facility there. Um, but generally speaking, I think with the first caravan, there was there was a decent amount of support um, from from the average Mexican person. Uh, but I, I, from what I've seen over time, that has that has decreased. Obviously, we've seen the videos in Tijuana yeah. uh, of people being frustrated with with them there. I think it's just you know sort of like you, you might initially say, yeah, yeah, I I support these people going looking for a better life. But then over time, when this becomes sort of a regular thing, and they overstay their welcome uh, and they start to impact the way you go about your daily life well yeah your people people's opinions start to start to change and I, I think that's probably what's going on right now um, in, in Mexico uh, what what was your interaction uh, at all with uh, border patrol and and what they had to say from their you know first person daily account of what's happening and what would make their jobs easier and frankly whether or not uh, what the president is proposing is uh, aligned with what they need yeah, I, I remember also visiting the border um, several years ago, and even back then it was clear that we had these problems, um, you know, where they were talking to us about how these are the people who are – it was right at the beginning when the asylum claims were starting to pick up, um, where they were or they were in sort of the middle of the, the massive increase. And so they knew this was becoming a problem. They knew there were these loopholes, and this has been – and so I've been writing about it for, for, for that long, basically saying, look – so these loopholes, these, these enforcement issues, are really undermining the border security because, you know, and that's why you know the president clearly talked about you know barriers and whatnot last night, but he also talked about a lot about all these other pieces right. because the reality is is that right now if you don't have good enforcement, you can have you can have the best border security in the world, but if someone gets across the border and they claim asylum and you can't remove them, 
if you if you have to do catch and release on people who you're catching, then the border security isn't doing you a lot of good. And I, so I definitely think we need this this broad approach to um, to, to immigration enforcement and border security. Um, and, and it's something which we've been we've known about for a long time, but policymakers still haven't really addressed these these core concerns. Since you were there with the caravan near the border, do you think it is a national emergency? You know, I, I, I don't think it necessarily rises to you know the president declaring um, and, and using some sort of executive you know national emergency authority. I do think that that this is a, a sort of a, a dire situation from a policy perspective. Things are only going to get worse. Um, but but the reality is is that we, I mean, in the past we've had you know millions of people coming across the border and, and the, you know in the, the 90s early 2000s so I can't say it reach, you know reaching that level of of, of severity but nonetheless the, the reality is right now we're catching a lot more people than we did back then but we just can't remove them and so from a policy perspective there are really stark challenges that we do face and that we need Congress to address because it, I, I, as a conservative I'm someone who says look I, I don't want to necessarily, necessarily just expand presidential authority I want to look for you know ways in which the, the, the president can you know not necessarily challenge the law I want everyone to stay within the law and I want the president not to be going, you know, to extreme measures to do some of these things. The best solution really is for Congress to act. I know that's seemingly unlikely right now, but that's the only durable solution to these problems. Congress needs to fix the laws and make sure that we have the right resources and tools to enforce our laws. He is David and Sarah, policy analyst on the topics of homeland security and cyber policy with the Heritage Foundation. David, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. It's what Chicago is talking about. It's Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan and Amy on AM560, The Answer.